chips are everywhere. In your PC, in your smartphone, in your car, in your fridge. The business of chips is a very international one. Raw materials, design and production of chips is dispersed all over the globe. That's why chip business is very reliant on geopolitics. If you want to understand the chip business and go for an exciting journey with me through the chip world today, I encourage you to watch this video with Robert Quinn, a leading semiconductor business commentator, blogger and expert, and Thomas Park, a private equity professional with a vast knowledge and passion for the semiconductor business. Tom, uh, there yes. are say, uh, many deliberations of commentators and, and the press over the political situation uh, over Taiwan. Uh, with the war in Ukraine, uh, we are all worried if, if China may in, invade Taiwan uh, these days. Why is Taiwan so important for the semiconductor industry? Well, it's important for a couple of different reasons, but primary, uh, the company itself, one company, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, they are the largest uh, producers of chips, of what they call the high-end chips. Okay? And right now, the numbers float sometimes between 60% market share, some as high as 85% market share. But they are the, the company that produces, for example, in the US, they produce the chips for the iPhones, okay? So China, it's not just that one company, but also you have an entire ecosystem of chip building there. So their ability to process uh, key scientific materials, raw materials, they have the technical knowledge. So it's a whole culture ecosystem of understanding how chips are made. And, um, Taiwan and Korea are, are the two best at that, with the United States under uh, Texas coming really fast, as a fast third. Um, and so whoever owns the chips owns the, the computing power that powers all of the technology devices that we use today. Just imagine that if everything goes. And Taiwan is a big factor at this point. There's a big there's a big push right now between Korea and China catching up to Taiwan right now. There's you're hearing some the Korean government basically saying, hey, we need to step it up. We need to be the king at the king in this court. But uh, Taiwan has built over, wow, say over the last 20, 30 years, a consistency to produce the high quality chips that you that we're experiencing today. And that's why we're concerned that China, the China took over Taiwan. They don't know how to run it. They wouldn't know how to run the chips themselves. The Taiwanese would leave, and all of a sudden, we we all as a as a different users of that specific chip technology will be in trouble. Okay. Robert, if you want to add to it as well. So yeah, that that's a it's a it's a big question, and it's really important as well. So another thing that's really important to that part is uh, the EUV technology. And so I guess it was around 2016. Um, we were. Moore's law was kind of coming to a, uh, a, a, a like a, we were wondering where's the Moore's law going to go because uh, we were at around seven nanometers or so and we didn't have the EUV technology in place and we were wondering how we can make the, the, the photolithography was the bottleneck for the industry. We couldn't, we can do things like atomic layer deposition within the, the making the, these chips. But, um, but the hardest part was doing the photolithography and bringing that neck, bringing the node da down to the next node. Um, you know, you hear about seven nanometer technology and 10 nanometer technology. Well, we kind of got hung up with this technology in the photolithography sector and um, a, a company, um, a, a company called um, ASML, uh, came out with a tool called uh, EUV, and the EUV tool brings it down to the next node. So we're able to go from seven nanometers now down to they're saying they can get down to one nanometer. Um, now, whether that's feasible of being able to mass produce chips at one nanometer, we don't, we're not sure if we can do it, but the technology is there uh, to be able to do, to be able to do these things. But uh, what happened is TSMC uh, was the one that really got a hold of this technology and started, um, invested a lot of money and a lot of time into uh 
bringing the 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 node down to the next to the next level using the EUV. So when that happened, uh, TSMC uh, and kind of did it in the dark. Like they didn't they didn't do it in the dark, but they they everybody knew what they were doing, but nobody really invested like they did. Nobody really had the foresight that they did, and uh, they now are the only ones in the world that can produce chips using EUV technology. And so that's so, that's the big problem is that that you know right now the whole world is dependent on Taiwan and that's a that's a huge uh, a huge issue because only Taiwan can make this this uh, this new EUV technology. Now we're building we're building fabs around the world. Uh, Samsung is going to be an EUV fab uh, here in Texas. Uh, they're going to build uh, obviously Intel is building EUV fabs uh, around the United States and 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 everybody is everybody's trying to start to build EUV fabs now but they're and these machines are incredibly expensive they're uh, 150 million dollars for one machine um it, and so the, it's an ex huge investment right <laughs> and so these um uh, these these this technology is going is going to be the backbone of the of the future of technology but it's going to take a while to get there. Uh, we're not going to get there overnight. It's going to take years to be able to get these other fabs up and running and going producing EUV, uh, these EUV fabs up and running. And so as we wait uh, for these new fabs to come online, we're dependent on Taiwan. So Taiwan's going to be a very critical, important uh, place for um, uh, quite a few years to come. So uh, as they are right now. One of the key assumptions that Robert and I are making and for your audience to understand is in the chip business, okay, the technology, uh, the way it, it, it's not a smooth evolution, right? It's a disruptive change at each different new platform or new technology. And we've, and as we, when Robert's talking about nanos, he's talking about the actual size of the little chips, pretty soon they get to a point where you and the human eye can't see it, right? And that we can actually start making these types of chips that it will empower, we'll put more chips into more things, right? Into clothes and everything else. They yeah, call it AI uh, chips, right? The the, the ones yeah. that, are, that are let's say uh, put into let's say gear, uh, and it's not like a, like like a sports gear, but it's a lot of, like like a medical devices. It's really RFMD stuff, but you're going to see more computing power on these chips. So right now, a lot of the chips that you see in in like clothing, for example, right? It's or shoes. It's designed to track, for example. But going forward, it's going to be more than that. It's like the shoes themselves can think, you know. I, I it's not, it's, it wouldn't be unheard of very soon that your shoe learns how you walk and adapts to it. Okay, yeah. so we're going to get to that point. We're going to have that type of capabilities, and, and as Robert eloquently said, Taiwan, especially with EV, that is the newest technology that everyone is morphing around, and they're ahead. My head by at least, I would say, what, three, five years right now, you would think? Yes. In terms of Samsung yes. catches up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Three to five years ahead. Yeah. So that, so there's that evolution, that pop, that EV is the next level up that you see. It's not only about how you can, sh it's like the best way to describe it. It's someone who's overweight and he needs to lose weight, right? You can lose weight a couple of inches at a time, but to drastically do a massive weight loss to change a lifestyle. And that's exactly what's happening with every new technology in the chip business. It's a change of a process, change of technology that really all of a sudden shrinks how fast the chips become. I mean, tiny, tiny, tiny. Robert, if you want to add to it, I mean, I just want to give yeah. that for your for your listeners. The the so I always like to take I I teach classes and I talk about the the technology and where it's going, and uh, so. We've gone from everybody's familiar with the transistor bulb, right? The the transistor bulb from the nineteen, uh, what was it, fifty four or fifty six? It was originally created. Uh, we built computers using these transistor bulbs, and we would have these huge server rooms with uh, full of these. We still, these, these we still have them in am amplifiers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. If you're a guitar player, you, like you can still see them in amplifiers. Yeah, yeah, if you if you if you play music, you're still familiar with these transistor bulbs. Well, that was the original transistor. That was a single transistor, right? And we've gone, we've brought that technology down to um, to nano levels, 
So now we are, and I always talk to people about what we're doing in, in semiconductor because even to my wife and kids, it's just kind of like this magic that happens, right? And to understand what we're doing um, on a uh, kind of a normal level, like, so we're, 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 we're these machines that we're working on, they pump down to a vacuum of 10 to the negative nine tor. What does that mean? That means deep space vacuum. So we're, these machines are coming down to a vacuum, of deep space vacuum. Then they're injecting a plasma that's as hot as the surface of the sun. That, that, you know, you can imagine how hot that is. And then and we're exciting the molecules within the chambers. And we're doing processes like, we're doing processes like EUV, and, or, or not EUV, we're doing atomic layer deposition, physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition, uh, etching, and all these different processes. There's about 200 processes that are involved in making that advanced computer chip today. And then we're making chips now. At, we're, we're, say, we're saying that we're bringing the technology, the technology node is not, not for mass production, but the, we're able to make chips now at three nanometers. What does three nanometers mean? That means 21 atoms wide. The transistor gate is 21 atoms wide. And so we're, we're stacking atoms. I mean, the technology is, is, is crazy where we've gone and where we're going in the future. But this... This is a Cerevis chip. This is a single chip. It is 2.6 trillion transistors and 850,000 cores. This is the new AI technology. This is the new advanced uh, uh, smart computer technology that we're, that we're building servers with. We're going to build servers with these, these types of chips now in the future. Now, this is a, a larger, um, this, this is all done at seven nanometers. Um, so they're, they're not going down to the, the, the super small nodes that you're familiar with, but the technology is amazing and people don't understand where it is and where it's going because it's going to go parabolic in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, we don't really bring the technology down to a smaller node. Now we change technology and we do new architecture. We start uh, doing 2D packaging. We start doing 3D packaging. Um, we start doing... Um, you know, with the smaller nodes, we're able to do different types of architectures and different types of packaging um, to advance the technology and have faster and smaller and 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 better and chips. And and then we're doing things like neuromorphic computing, uh, where computers are operating in the sense of a of, of a human brain. Human brain is the most best computer in the world. There's nothing. There's nothing more advanced. There's nothing more um, the 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 electro electro the electronic synapses that happen in your brain are are so amazing and, and it's such an, a minute electrical scale that there's no computer that can do what the human brain does and uh at this time <laughs> but um uh, we're, we're getting there very quickly um yeah. but we're uh, so being able to see where technology is where it's going is just it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And so tying all of Robert's amazing comments just now, Master, just think about this. Currently right now, the company that could have that capability to produce those chips in quantities that we could use is right now the leader, which is TSMC out of Taiwan. So if China got a hold of that, now you understand all of a sudden all this beautiful technology, all this possible... I mean, we're talking... The semiconductor industry today is challenging the laws of physics, so laws of elements, okay, or chem law of chemistry. And imagine that in the hands of the Chinese, right? Who may not always be, you know, democratic in the way they want to share the information. So yeah, it's a big concern. Because right now, TSMC is the company that could, at this current point in time, based on scales and skills and so forth, be the one that actually makes this stuff for us. I mean, we may have other people design it, but to actually make it, it's those guys. So that's why we're concerned about Taiwan. Before we go, let's say further, why do we have chip shortage right now in general? You want to take a shot at that, Robert? It was a, it was a compounded uh, uh, issue. Um, COVID happened, um, obviously. Uh, we ex experienced um, a big slowdown in many fabs, but the chip, whenever people say chip shortage, it's not your cell phone chip that we're short. 
it's this it's the chip that goes in your transmission that we're short so there's there's a, a lot of understanding the technology node is really important in that sense because it's um it, it's not the samsung and, T, uh, and and tsmc that are short chips it's the uh computer it's the chips that are being made in china and being made at other places around the world that are the 100 and that are the 128 nanometer chips they're the the big technology uh the the old technology we call it legacy technology the old legacy technology that's 128 nanometers plus uh i, I heard that there was a uh, NXP was doing 200 and something nanometers, which is huge technology, technology that came out in the 90s, um, like in, 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 in late 90s, um, early, not, not, I'm sorry, not the late 90s, but uh, the, the, the 2000s, um, early 2000s. Um, but yeah, the, like this isn't, whenever you hear about this, this chip shortage, um, it's it's not the cell phone. It's not the chip in your cell phone. It's not your Intel processor that you're short. It's it's the um, it's the chip that goes into your transmission of your vehicle. It's a chip that goes into your everyday appliances, your washing machine, your your um, your 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 washer and dryer in your in your living room. Um, the, these old technology chips that are really easy to make actually. Are, are the ones that are impacting the market the most and they're the hardest to get a hold of right now. Why did it happen? It happened because of a compounded thing. There was a fire at a fab um, that during COVID there was um, that shut down a in major Japan. fab that was doing. Yes. And, and, and uh, the, you know, that had a, 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 they were doing the, this larger technology. Um, there was um, obviously a lot of fabs slowed down. Uh, they weren't able to have the, a lot of fab, some of them shut down uh, because because of COVID. They were they were trying to figure out what how we're going to you know um, have people running these fabs, but yet still dealing with COVID at the same time. Um, there was um, obviously logistics issues. Um, there was a lot of uh, fabs that weren't able to get the parts. These these machines, they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, one of the things I spent many years of my career doing was being the engineer that came in and worked on that machine. Um, and you, they need they need PMs. Uh, we call it, we call it maintenances. They, they need regular maintenances every 30,000 wafers. You take the machine apart, you change out the process kits, you change out, you know, certain parts within the, within the, the machine, and then you bring it back up and you start running it again. Um, that needs these, 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 uh, these processes done. The, the semiconductor ecosystem, system is huge people have no idea how big it is and the amount of support it takes outside of that fab to be able to keep that fab running is absolutely incredible it's an incredible huge ecosystem and so those people the outside ecosystem they started they were dealing with COVID. they were slowing down they were having a hard time supporting the fabs because they didn't have the manpower to be able to, to to do those types of things it was a huge domino effect that caused this chip shortage and and we're we're getting there um we we are catching up um but uh, what people don't understand a lot of times though is that we, we hear about all these new fabs that are going up um and those are not going to really fix our chip shortage at this time they're going to be able to um better support the new technology and the the new technology that we're going to depend on in the future but the real the real um the the fabs from china the the skywater technology the, the fab here in the united states the the european fabs the um a lot of a lot of fabs in europe they're doing the older te legacy technology um i think i believe bosch is doing um a, a larger node as well they're they're doing the the older the older legacy technology as well on 200 millimeter um but understanding the node and um and then i guess we could get into later 200 and 300 millimeter technology in the future but um and, and later in our talk but um understanding the nodes and and how we went from this uh large technology to the smaller technology and uh that's really important but it was a compounded thing that really made um that made this chip shortage happen and we're getting out of it very quickly i think so so, Master, if I could kind of humanize a little bit more for everyday 
for everyday thinking, okay? You mentioned that you were going to make dinner tonight, right? Yes. Imagine your kitchen is the fab, okay? But unlike the kitchen, the fab has to be responsible for the type of ingredients it gets, right? So for you, you go to the grocery store and say, I need to get the, yeah, the noodles. I need to get the vegetables and all of that. You go to the grocery store and get that. In the, in the entire semiconductor industry business, okay, you have to worry about the quality of that damn noodle, okay, and how that's going to affect your your the, the the quality of your dish you're going to make. The supply chain is problematic for the semiconductor industry. Huge. It's because of the, the number of different processes. Just your just the thought of you putting in all the ingredients for your rest for your recipe for your meal tonight. You, you're talking about maybe what 10, 11 ingredients. So we're talking semiconductor industry. You're talking thousand thousand. I mean. I mean, just astronomical numbers that one little blip could impact several other processes along the way. So imagine you making that meal. It's like making that chip, okay? You know, you got to make sure your frying pan works. You got to make sure the gas in the oven works. I mean, all of that. And then, you know, I, I forgot to get the noodles. I got to go get the, oh, the noodles are out. I got to switch. So you can't switch to another type of pasta, right? So it's very specific, very excisive. There are a lot of processes involved. So as you're thinking about your dinner tonight, just think about if one of the ingredients wasn't there, how would you adapt? You really can't in the semiconductor business, especially in the uh, more of the older, larger nodes and larger ship sizes. Um, it's it, it was problematic just because the people that were involved, especially China, they weren't good at adapting, and that's why uh, the one of the things worth mentioning is that Hyundai um, they own a company called Mobius, which is their uh, parts arm. Okay, they want to go into the semiconductor business. They want to start making their own chips. Because they don't want to rely on outsiders anymore. Right. They said, "Hey, but we don't want to do this anymore. We want to. We want to have our own kitchen with our own products and not have to worry about anybody else doing it for us." Is it the approach the world over now? Because the, the U.S. is is offering some serious um, um, tax cuts or or other um, instruments uh, to bring back. Uh, Cheap production home, which originally, let's say, was uh, was in the U.S. or let's say semiconductors <laughs> were invented by by the late uh, Gordon Moore, who passed away just just a week ago, as we are in this. And yes, and then then it was let's say um, outsourced to 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 East Asia over the over the decades. Uh, so is it like? Um, Still, this isolationist now approach. Let's bring let's bring cheap production home, or is it let's move to to new markets with 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 the production, or maybe with the design as well? How would you respond to that? Robert, you want to take a shot? I have my ideas. <laughs> Tommy, uh, well, the the why don't you shoot for it, Tom, and I'll and I'll follow up on it. How about that? Okay. So the master, yes, the technology of the chip was started in the U.S., okay? And just like in the 80s um, and into the 90s, everything was easier to, to send it overseas because of cost of labor, right? And in particular, Taiwan and Korea at the time said, you know, why not us? Why not us start building those things for Americans, right? Uh, and so they got really good at it over time. They just got really efficiently good at it. For, that's why Taiwan and TSMC, they're good at making the process of the chips, the design and the functionality and all that. It's up to other companies to provide that, but they're very, very good at what they do. So the United States came to the realization, wait a minute, the way too many of the chips are coming from Asia now, from Taiwan and Korea. We don't really have, but in the US, we're a big user of the, of the chips. We have Silicon Valley here. We make a lot of the most cutting edge technology here. So the, the, and also something else about the chip, you're making an actual product. So when you buy it, wherever you are, but you, it's made in Taiwan, a lot of that money goes back to Taiwan. So it creates wealth. So there's also a wealth factor with the chips. Basically the United States has come to realize, you know what, we need to bring it back on the US. US is the largest, you know, economy with $25 trillion, okay? But it slipped in the in the in the manufacturing of the chips themselves. So they're trying to bring it back. They're throwing a lot of money at it, but it doesn't necessarily fix the problem overnight because right now the people who are benefiting from that are Samsung <laughs> right now in the US. 
right? So eventually the profits go back to, to Korea for, uh, so that what the U.S. is trying to do is put more chip fabs here in the U.S., more of the process of the entire chip ecosystem here in the U.S., that's their goal. They will make an impact, but I need out they will make an impact. It isn't just because of dollars, that certainly helps, but the U.S. has other, other aspects that are huge factors in the chip business. A huge pool of uh, talent. Okay, the reason Texas is doing so well because you got a lot of major universities. You got Texas A and M. You got University of Texas. You, several other uh, Rice universities. There's already a pool of talent, young talent coming out that are tech savvy coming out of the entire state. Also, in addition, access to raw materials that you need, especially you know, clean water, for example. Right. So there are a lot of raw materials and processes that the Texas does have in Arizona too. Uh, now they're talking about something in Ohio and other states, okay? The United States is blessed with a lot of natural resources. It really is. Some of the critical materials that we need still is China, but all said and done, the US has a lot of natural raw materials and you throw some money in it like Biden did, it's gonna be enticing for more and more of the fabs to wanna open up in the US. US. Uh, the one aspect we'll talk about is labor, okay? In terms of labor laws, I think will have an impact. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. But right now, for example, in, in Asia, you know, they work long hours there. Um, can that be replicated in the U.S.? Some of that, yes, absolutely. Can that rep replicated in the Middle East or Europe or South America? Questionable right now. It's probably the best way to say. It, okay. So in response to your question, it isn't just the money, but it's also the resources for the entire industry that is needed. And Texas has it. It has it naturally in the other states, Arizona as well. Um, so just to add to that, um, there, I, I think that they're really trying to make a global balance of fabs around the world. Um, so many of them right now, the, especially uh, uh, of the major, fa the mega fabs, so many of the chips right now, majority of them are produced in Asia. Um, and they're wanting to see more of a balance of that. Um, from around the world. Um, the the one thing that I keep hearing people in the United States talking about is bringing back the chip industry to the U.S. and making it um, an at-home, 100% at-home thing. You can't do that. Um, the these, these things that we carry every day in our, in our pockets, our cell phones that we carry every day, these things are you have no idea how much um, international um, uh, collaboration goes into making that phone. Uh, the amount of minerals that it takes to produce the that phone is incredible. Now, we can't... China mines over 90% of the rare earth magnets around the world. This is what I heard. So, is, 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 is it really like that? Yes, yes. And, <laughs> and and we're there's countries that are that are are discovering some rare earth rare earths right now that are but they're lot, still lot right the, there 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 there's one in Europe that they just discovered some rare earth magnets and they're going to start mining that, but they're years out, right? I mean we're still we're we're still years out from being able to have that as a sustainable source for reducing the dependence of, of rare earth magnets. But China produces nine over 90 percent of the rare earth magnets right now on this earth and so for us to produce these chip these phones it takes a collaboration of countries from around the world the, the neon gas comes from ukraine the 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 magnets come from china the 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 architecture comes from the united states the um the manufacturing comes from a lot of different parts of, of Asia. Um, the it's it's such an incredible, um, huge infrastructure of global infrastructure that we depend on to be able to make these phones to be, make this technology happen. Not one country is going to produce these these uh, these things independently by themselves. Um, it, it's it, it is it is a huge infrastructure to make this happen. Um, so. It, to understand that is really important, I think, and to understand that these, you know, you you see these uh, these polarization of these countries, you know, saying that they want to be the leader or they want to be the leader, and we're going to go independent. 
it's it's not it's not realistic um you you this is a this is a huge collaboration of a global collaboration to make these this technology happen and uh we have to have that balance but what they're trying to do now is to make that more balanced into where where we do have you know euv fabs in the united states or we do have euv fabs in germany or we do have you know different technologies from around the world um and i just got back from oman uh you know who would have thought that we would be producing chips in in the middle east but they're they're looking to do it um the, i just got back from a large conference i was speaking at there um it, it's it's uh everybody in the world is looking to get into the chip industry industry nobody's going to do it independently alone um, but I think it is important that we have this global infrastructure of chip production um, around the world. So we're not dependent on one section. We've seen what happens uh, with things like COVID. Whenever we have this imbalance of of uh, of dependence of of one sector uh, uh, in one area of the world, um, what happens when you know there's there's so many things that could happen just with uh, you know natural disasters and natural uh, you know, things where we saw what happened to Japan, you know, and, and what if we were dependent on what if all this EUV equipment was in Japan at that time, we would have shut down the world um, from, you know, during the during the tsunami and during the earthquakes that that happened out there, like the, you know, thank goodness that technology wasn't there. And it was actually in Taiwan during that time. But, you know, we, we're so dependent and we don't realize that we're we're hanging on by a thread, really, because it, what happens, you know, uh, just, you know, if we shut down one sector, we have to balance this, this technology from around the world. And that's really important that we, we have infrastructure of this technology from all over the world so that we can continue to produce, um, if things happen, you know, you, you have to, you have to think that way as that way as well. And, uh, we have to we have to think about where all these materials come from. Uh, they're going to come from all over the world, and and uh, nobody can be able to do it alone. So, sorry, cool. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. The interdependence of all of this is is incredible. I mean, it is. So that's why if you know, back to your first question and, and adds to what Rob was born is. Let's say next week China invades Taiwan. Okay, the disruption is so major. When it comes to this specific industry and all the applications that people you you know depend on the ship for, okay, um, and you have such a diaspora of Taiwanese talent going all over the world, right? So it's that it's very calamitous if that happens. It is extremely calamitous. It's it's worth fighting a war over actually in that situation to prevent China from getting access to this type of technology and being able to th bottleneck everything. That would be such a calamitous event. Yes, is I, that serious? I quoted, let's say, before we started, uh, a U.S. Secretary of Defense from the from the 60s or 50s. I don't remember the name from the book Cheap War that we all know, uh, as I presume, and most of our audience probably do. It's like uh, with with cheap production, you you never know where where the technology ends and and geopolitics starts. Yes, I, I'll give you something else to think about that really. I learned a lesson in my business class in 1998 that stunned me. Okay, it stunned the crap out of me because, um, and I, I, I'll make a quick note so you can understand why it brings everything to light. It was an international business class I was taking, work, and we had several students who were Chinese American, right? And we had a couple of students who were Chinese, okay? And for some reason, the, the debate was going on about you know China's imperialism, the rise of China, how China wants to grab everything, okay? And the funny thing was that they were talking specifically about Taiwan. This one gentleman from like Shenzhen from Taiwan, a Chinese China from mainland China, looked at me because Tom, you better not complain because you know we have rights to you guys too. And I paused and I thought about it, like they could actually have rights to Korea if they wanted to make that claim. Okay, the rise of China imperialism could occur not only in Taiwan but part of Vietnam. They also they could try to make a claim into Korea as well. The, the, the original laws in Korea are still written in Chinese. And a, and a lawyer today in, in Korea has to know at least 10,000 Chinese characters. So yeah, there's, there's it's not just Taiwan. If Taiwan goes, Korea's. I mean, I know, let's say that the, the Korea was like really very hardly, uh, very hardly, how you call it, 
they the the, the, the Chinese let's say try to de denationalize or and the Japanese the the, the, the Koreans. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and that's why this year, it's a bit, it's it's a lot like uh, that's why I said you know Poles and Koreans know a lot alike. We have a very similar history, and so when I you know this year only a couple of weeks ago. Japan opened up its market, chip market to Korea. So I'm like, whoa, that's huge. That's actually, that's going to benefit the China, the Korean uh, semiconductor manufacturers over the Japanese, I think, because of cost and because of the quality and so forth. I, it was, that was a huge, that was a huge thing. That was it. I was like shaking my head, like, I can't believe we actually got to a point where China and Korea are really starting to open up some of the most sensitive markets together. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. From what I read is let's uh, first of all let's say my my general impression hopefully I'm right is that China will not decide to to invade Taiwan. Uh, there's too much at stake and and we can go for for four hours let's say to talk about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that the, the threat is real. Mm. And from what I read is that that. Um, if they decided, you know, to make a, a kind of D-Day uh, land, landing, uh, this would have destroyed the SMC fab. fab. I yeah. know that's true. I would say it's not only that, but look at it this way. With China and Taiwan, I think more of a concern is with China put an embargo around the whole island. I think that's more of a bigger concern if it actually happens, right? Um, that's a bigger problem if they did that, the Chinese did that. That's why the fight over the Southeast Asian seas between China and the United States uh, Navy is a big deal. Because what you could literally do is, to attack Taiwan, you destroy the value of Taiwan, right? And everything included in there. So the Chinese are, the Chinese are first and foremost, they've only been communists for 70, 80 years. They're, they've been traders, economists, or uh, commerce uh, business people over 5,000 years. They understand the value of money, they understand the value of business. So they'll, they'll probably, and circle the island if they could and just threaten it that way that's yeah, how this, i think the, 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 this, is, this, this is probably the possible yeah uh much that's why, you know and there's only it's not just pride i mean you ask the everyday chinese ethnic chinese they believe taiwan's part of their their world and they have you ask the ethnic taiwanese like hell no we're not but at the end of the day, it's you know, who has power, who has the ability. And right now, there's a political war happening because all the diplomats, you know, countries are starting to recognize. I noticed, for example, recognize China over Taiwan. It's it's the all these little battles are happening right now. But the core of it, you know, what's the value of Taiwan? It's an island off the coast of China. Well, it's the chips. Let's let's be frank. It's the they're the chip powerhouse of the world right now. So moving moving so, chip production to East Asia in the sixties was also kind of building a shield against against China and, and the USSR as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, politically. Another important thing to understand as well is that the sanctions that are happening right now uh, between the United States and China. So I spoke about the EUV technology. The this is the technology that brings us down to the next node that allows us to have the most advanced, you know, the newer advanced chips that Taiwan has. Well, guess what? We're doing so. The United States owns a patent within this new EUV technology, despite the fact that it's not made in the United States, it's made in Europe. Um, it is the United States does have a patent in that technology, and we are preventing that patent and that technology to be sold to china um there is a sanction that we have we have prevented the that country from selling that new ev technology to china and so <laughs> that's one of the reasons why they're fairly upset uh right now is because uh, they're not able to get and, and the the technology is um going to be very 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 hard to reverse engineer um can it be done yes um the lens uh, the lens that is is made um it's like point to zero to the 19th scale or it's it's something crazy uh to where uh this perfection of this lens that goes into this laser it takes a year to produce just the lens that's inside of this machine um it, it will be very very hard to reverse engineer um for for china to do so they're trying to buy it we're preventing it from going there through sanctions 
And, and that's kind of one of the ways that geopolitically you're seeing these countries battle each other um, is through sanctions and preventing them from getting a hold of the new, new technology that allows them to go down to the next nodes. So. Yeah. It's, it's a greater emphasis by, President, by Premier Xi because what's happening is that he did something about a year ago, okay, that he basically is trying to protect a lot of the Chinese startups because what's happened for almost a decade, a lot of the larger Chinese companies will come in and zoop up the smaller Chinese startups or kill them out of business. What Z realizes is that for China to really become the player it wants to be and envisions to be, it needs to actually create the, the technology, the new technology. Can't just be the copycat. It's been doing that for decades and now he's like, we need to be a leader in this stuff. We need to put together all the processes in place. We need to bring their capital to it. We China needs to be the equivalent of Korea and Taiwan, for example, in the chip business. And that's what it wants to be. It really, that's what he would like for China to be known for. So just being a copycat country, right? They would they really want to create their own intellectual property and create their own. That's the key to the source of being able not rely so much on the US. As well. Some compare yeah, the race to... between the China and the US in, in, in development of AI as the race uh, between the Soviets and uh, and the US in the Cold War. So with, let's say, just... yes, so, 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 uh, so yeah, please go on. Now, what I was going to say, you can even take it to the chip. I mean, Robert and I had a discussion about this. Eventually, at some point, when you, sc- when you shrink it, chips are subatomic levels. I mean, we'll get to a point where chips are so tall and so small, it's ridiculous, right? To get to that level, you need something like AI involved in the process, right? So who programs that, you know, owns the keys? I was going to have... That, that the, um, AI needs chips. And we are all fascinated now with large language models, chat GPT and so on. But when yeah, I talk to some China experts uh, on this channel, the Chinese are are not competing really in large language model, though they do. They are focusing on, on putting AI into the industry, uh, into, See, into military, into like serious, serious business. Right. Um, like, I, like, like I mentioned before, and, and Robert, if you want to touch on what we can do with 3D printing and AI and all that in the chip business, but I'll just say simply this, okay? I, I like to tell Americans and Europeans this concept, okay? China's only been a communist country for 70 to 80 years. But commerce has been in China's blood for the ethnic Chinese for 5,000 years. That's why when it comes to negotiations, they can clean the clock out of a lot of people. If you look at the best business people in Asia, you t- take the top 100, like 65 are ethnic Chinese. It's part of the thought process and culture of knowing how to do business. So yeah, we can be goofing around on chat GPT, right? All of us Chinese are thinking, how do I put this in this? How do I, they're thinking about how to improve their capabilities. That's how they're thinking about it. And the whole thing about TikTok here in the US, it's funny because yeah, right. TikTok in the US is a bunch of you know kids being goofy and stupid, right? TikTok in China is like, you have to study hard. You have to do this. And that's their version of TikTok, right? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's the Chinese are about building better. It's what they're trying to do right now. It's a race they're, for that. Their their OEM market right now is growing at sixty seven percent. I believe it was sixty something percent. Uh, the so when I say OEM, this is the original equipment manufacturers. Right now, the uh, manufacturers of equipment, uh, this ASML tool that I was talking about, the EUV tool. This is called an OEM. We call these uh, these are our original equipment manufacturers. So these uh, we're very dependent on these uh, manufacturers and applied materials is a manu- is an OEM. Uh, land technology tokyo electron uh, all these companies are are oems well the uh, the i forgot what it was comparing it against but there was an american uh uh company that had grown at 11 percent and the chinese oems are growing at over 60 something percent uh year over year so, so the amount of growth that they're investing but you also talk about um the artificial intelligence within china 
um, you spoke about my my interview that I did with Dr. Navid. Uh, and Dr. Navid was in China, and he said he was walking down a, a particular district of China that was uh, um, that was very famous for its 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 technology hub. And he says he was just blown away because this is years ago. And he says every fifth company was an AI company. Um, he says he couldn't believe the amount of 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 investment that China was getting into artificial intelligence, and where would where it's going to be in the future. Uh, I'm afraid they're going to close the gap there because there's going to be a a lot of uh, they have a huge investment. China has an incredible investment in artificial intelligence right now, and uh, it, they they're being kind of quiet about it. Um, but I think we're going to see more things coming out of. Uh, um, East Asia, like the China in places um, with artificial intelligence versus, you know, chat GPT is just a start. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Um, where we're going to go in the future is going to be incredible. Um, but, uh, it, you know, and, and to me, I'm just blown away. We're all blown away with chat GPT technology where it's going to be in 10 years from now. It's just going to be astronomical. And, uh, and this is Alice. This is child's play right now. What we're doing with Chai GP, uh, it's child's play compared to what really can be done. This is just child's play. Yeah. The Chinese are trying to figure that out right now. Uh, and I hate to say it, I don't want to be so blase, but you know, for the Chinese, they're thinking, let the Americans and what Europeans play around with that. Well, we'll do something serious. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and uh, Elon Musk is begging for a moratorium, he's begging for us, the world, to stop producing artificial intelligence and slow down on this for a second. Yeah. As we need to collaborate to be able to build an, uh, a governing system that uh, so we don't get into trouble with this because we're playing with fire. Um, we're we're playing with fire and it can it can become dangerous if we uh, if we keep advancing at the um at, without any type of regulation or any type of governance to um artificial intelligence so we we have to look at it at that that's really important the good thing about china is let's say i'm some 200 plus kilometers 150 miles plus from the ukrainian border being based in warsaw and you know the, the the Soviets, as I call them, uh, uh, I think I think that they, they they've gone mad simply that they believe in Lenin, uh, another World War Two, and this this kind of stuff. Uh, why they uh, created a a massacre and a genocide, and. Uh, And the Chinese mentality, what you mentioned, Tom, I think prevents uh, prevents us from same kind of madness uh, because they are for 5,000 years business people, merchant people. There is this merchant culture. So... Hopefully. I mean, Taiwan could be... A tipping point where the where that rationality may disappear a little bit just because of the fact that it's an ethnic pride kind of thing but overall they still want what taiwan has to offer right and the chinese when they like for example if you look at africa china basically owns a big chunk of africa they really do with the loans they gave out and and some of the loans were designed so that the countries can't pay it back you know they're taking over ski bridges and stuff like that the fact is the Chinese are, are doing business around the world and that's how they're getting their influence. It's a it's a playbook that the Americans did for a long time. The Chinese are just are a little bitter at it right now because they got the money for it. Um, if you notice in terms of what they're trying to do, they're trying to increase their influence. I mean, there's just if you really want to see something interesting, look at China and Australia, okay? China was using Australia as a shopping cart, basically buying all the materials out of Australia. And there's a huge population of ethnic Chinese down in Australia today as well. There's a strategic importance for Australia to China. So the Chinese have gone around basically very strategically figured out, you know, we need to be in these key areas. So there's a reason for it. While the U.S. is, uh, is it's not so much focused on business. They allow business to be done at the company level, private level, right? But from a Government level, not so much, I think, as China has done, the Chinese have done. And it's more of we need to 
imply, work on our military. I mean, for the longest time, the U.S. Navy was the policeman of the world. Uh, that we were able to control the seas. And because of that, we allowed every other country to stop focusing on war, start focusing on business. And that's why all of a sudden you saw Germany very quickly become economic powerhouse after World War II. So we have allowed a lot of countries to buy into the fact that the United States will protect them. We won't we'll control the waters, we'll control as much with our military, provide the stability and allow you to be able to grow your country. Russia doesn't think like that. Russia thinks this is mine. I don't care if you, if I can't have it, no one else can. Okay, that's their mentality. That's their imperialistic mentality. It's always been part of Russia. I posted today something about that, actually. Um, I spent the, uh, real quickly, I spent a year studying Russian literature, 19th and 20th century Russian literature, and a year of Russian language, okay? And what that taught me more than anything else is what this imperial mindset's all about. And so they're always trying to go back to a glory days, and if they can't have it, no one else can. But what China takes approach is, we really want that, but we want it to be useful. That's the key thing. We want whatever we are involved with, we need it to be useful. So there's a key difference. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I recommend, I highly recommend the book by um, uh, Moscow's Guardian uh, correspondent, yeah. Luke Harding, called Invasion. You, you, you're you reading this or have read this? I've heard about it. I have not read it. I've heard about it. I've, you're the, like the third person to tell me I should read it. That's well. That's so it's, it seems like uh, there was a rationale in starting a war in Ukraine. Uh, I, I mean, that the thesis of Harding goes because uh, this was the only thing because let's say Russia was a kle kleptocracy and the only thing to keep the mafia state uh, going uh, and you know for all these guys to, to preserve all their wealth which it was situated abroad I mean that there is a little bit uh, uh, though it's a li little bit uh, unlogic it's uh, that they had to start something big for the nation, <laughs> some sort of games uh, in, in a very cruel and, uh, and a horrific way uh, to preserve the system, the kleptocratic system. Uh, I mean, that's a playbook from the Romans, right? What they did was, how do you keep the Roman citizens appeased? You go out after another country. That's what they did, right? That's man empire. So everyone is thinking about that and not so much about the day-to-day -day issues. The paradox is that, that, that they start, they put on fire, let's say, all their wealth uh, with the same move. So there is uh, absolute inconsistency. Uh, so here's the thing. I wanted to bring this back to the chip business for Poland. I mean, one of the questions you wanted us to talk about is, you know, yes. Poland. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. Um, uh, Robert, you know, and I, we, we talked about, you know, my passions. And you know, I'll just say this real quickly for your audience. Bars are called Polska, okay? Uh, Polski. Um, I see a race, okay? A technology race. And I see the Taiwanese, they're going to do well. The Koreans, you know, my country brother, man, well. they're going to do well. The United States, because it has so much for it, it's going to do well. Okay. And Europe right now, Germany is in the race now. Okay. Japan's yeah. in the race. China's trying to get into the race. China, <laughs> we're trying to make it harder. I would like to see Poland get in the race as well and not just be a bystander. Um, and the reason I've been asking folks within both the government and also people in the different industry uh, within Poland, you know, where our capabilities are. Because at the end of the day, there has to be a sizable chip production capabilities in, in, in Europe, okay? And right now it's coalescing in around the Dreisen area, the Silicon Saxony as they call it, right? Um, and I wanna see Silicon Polska as well. There is something to be said, especially the history of Europe as we know it, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown that peace only lasts for so many years, okay? Um, that we, it makes sense to have several different players in the race in the chip business. Um, that's why I'm focused. It's kind of a crazy passion of mine because it makes no sense for a Korean man to all of a sudden, be, and who grew up as an American, all of a sudden wants to see Poland in the race. This simply because I believe Poland has 
the ingredients for it, not maybe necessarily have to compete at the highest level, the EV, EUV level, okay? They can get to that with time. Um, just like China could, right? Uh, Poland can do the same thing. So could Germany as well. Germany could, uh, Germany's uh, is ahead of Poland, but Poland has the, the skills. They have the skills for it. I believe they have the willingness. Do they have the budget for it? That's something else. Okay, but I believe we produce enough technologists, uh, enough engineers to be able to make a good run for it. I mean, it, the best way to describe it is, let's say Poland knows how to walk and they know how to run, but they haven't really been in a race before. And they're trying to figure out whether they can actually run in the race. And that's the best way to describe it. And, I'm, and I've been trying to get companies from, you know, Samsung and uh, especially Samsung, and uh, and I'm trying to get SK as well, but uh, TSMC definitely. Hey, look at Poland for a minute. See what Poland can do in your in your overall design, in terms of your ability to produce chips. That's what I'm done because I'm, I'm sure they've already talked to Germany. My question is, have you really talked to Poland as well? I also understand a lot of the ecosystem about the semiconductor industry. Samsung Austin produces a billion dollars of chips every year. 100% of those chips get packaged up, thrown on an airplane, and flown back to Korea to be to be chopped. You can see in the picture behind me how they're actually taking the chips out of the wafer, right? So they're chopping, they, take, they cut the wafer, they take the chips out, and then they put them in. There's a whole nother ecosystem behind making that chip that is the packaging and and the testing and the the cutting of the of these chips. There's a whole nother ecosystem there. Why can't Poland be part of that ecosystem, you know, in collaboration with you know Germany and these other countries doing the packaging and the other parts as well? Um, that's a that's a whole nother part of the semiconductor industry that that it's a fairly a lot cheaper to get involved in and a, a big demand right now. They they need they we we need this right now um, for. for for many places need this um, and versus sending things back because I right now majority of the packaging and testing and, and cutting is done in Asia. Um, so why can't uh, Poland be uh, that hub for that? And and there's other there's many different parts places where um, Poland could be involved in the semiconductor industry. Um, but that's just one of them. I mean, right now, Kodansk is, is there's a lot of design houses there. OK, chip design houses. That's great. Uh, for me, I, I, I per and I, this is just my take. I, I, I want to just speak for myself. I don't want to put words in Robert's mouth here. Um, for me, chip design could be relocated anywhere. Okay, it really can. But to the whole concept of you know creation of the chip itself and also the packaging and testing, that doesn't get moved. That stays. Okay, and so that creates an, uh, the basis for an ecosystem that you can build around that creates wealth. And then it, the, for the Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley for one reason. It started with chips. People forget about that. There's a reason they call it Silicon, right? Chips and computers. And then we got to where we got blockchain and all the other technologies that sits on top of that. What happens is you have the basis, then you can build a technology that feeds into that and then technology that uses that. And, and that's how you create that myth, that mythical, I hope, Silicon Polska one day. Uh, I want that to happen sooner than later. To right. Robert's point, places you can play in. Gentlemen, this was a fascinating discussion. Uh, I would love to make a, a, a second episode, but we're slightly running out of time. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. I, th I think it was, let's say, hugely interesting and hugely uh, intellectually uh, moving for me and I hope for the audience as well. And yes, uh, we my, my biggest takeaways are that uh, Silicon Valley started from chips and chips are the heart of of computing, uh, which we are starting to forget. And whereas Poland uh, is uh, is quite relevant on the world map uh, as it comes to software development and slightly as, to, as it comes to AI, uh, we shouldn't forget the, the chip business. 
I just want to say one thing. Thank you for having us, Mass J. Um, and for the listeners, I know that most of your listeners are going to be Polish, okay? So probably Najwan Zani Thomas Park. Um, but I want everyone here, if you want to really stay on top of this, follow Robert Quinn, okay? Go on LinkedIn, follow him. Because this gentleman, he started his stuff out of pure passion, and then he got everyone to join him for that. Um, and you, and this, he just, you, he, if you cut him up right now, you'll see chips coming out of his body. Okay. That's how much he loves what he's doing. Right. I mean, yeah. that thing in the background. Okay. That's his toys. That's what it is. And, okay. and if you follow him, you just by following his LinkedIn post, you'll become an expert over time. You just will guaranteed. You don't have to do anything else. Just follow his stuff. That's what I, I, watched, you I watched Robert's channel and I could fully confirm this. <laughs> It's it's That's incredible. Somebody. Let's say how 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 wide Robert's knowledge on the topic is, and and how, let's say, uh, how let's say Renaissance kind of knowledge it is. Let's say, because in Robert observes cheap business from let's say various angles, and this is yeah. quite uh, probably the most fascinating thing about Robert and and his knowledge and his channel. So thank you, huge honor, Robert, to to have had you here. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Master. Thank you, Barzo. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Do you want to Thank you so much for listening to Sherpa Search on Tech. If you have enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our show wherever you listen. Thanks again. The Sherpa Search on Tech podcast is a production of Sherpa Search, an executive search firm specializing in the tech industry, helping hire the right people for expert and managerial positions, and advising how to build and develop long-lasting, high-performing IT teams. If you would like to learn more, reach out to us at maciej.szczerba at sherpasearch.tech or visit our website sherpasearch.tech. See you next time. Thank you.